Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 10th anniversary ceremony of the passage of House Resolution 121. My name is Eileen Chung. Um, I'm currently the Executive Secretary of the Washington Coalition for Comfort Women Issues and co-chair of the House Resolution 121's Anniversary Ceremony Committee. We are gathered here today to celebrate and affirm, reaffirm the meaning of House Resolution 121's passing and also to honor and recognize its contributors. Without further ado, um, I would like to introduce you to Ed Royce. He has represented California's 39th district from year 1993 to 2003, 40th district from year 2003 to 2013, and is currently representing the 39th district since 2013. He has been and continues to be a great advocate of the comfort women issues. He not only co-authored House Resolution 121 as a senior member of the Asia Subcommittee at the time, he helped organize a hearing of testimonies from several comfort women and made certain that the legislation was brought to the floor and passed. Um, we'd like to also thank him for sponsoring this wonderful event. If you could come. Thank you. Anyang Haseyo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, especially a pleasure to be here with Mike Honda. Uh, and as you know, Mike Honda was the author of this legislation. I was his co-author trying to get it through committee uh, 10 years ago. And Judy Chu has always spoke out and supported this effort as well. And, and so today I think it is a time to reflect a time to reflect also because we had a great victory before the Supreme Court of the United States who refused to hear uh, the attempts uh, to remove the Glendale Peace statue that stands in commemoration of uh, the comfort women and what they went through. And I, I will just quickly tell you that 10 years ago when this bill came up, we did organize a hearing at that time to allow the grandmothers to speak, to have them tell us about their personal experiences. And that was so powerful before the Foreign Affairs Committee. And the arguments they made, so persuasive, that when the Korean American community, uh, when you did this effort to get this bill up before the House of Representatives, it passed unanimously. And I, I do want to recognize Phyllis Kim and, and the Washington Coalition for Comfort Women Issues and the Korean American Forum of California and all the other organizations that have been engaged in this effort to make sure that justice is done. I also wanted to share with you that we had an ongoing effort as we brought grandmothers out to California and in cities like Fullerton, my own city that passed a resolution, we had them testify there as well before the community. Our goal has been to educate across the United States so that the next generation of Americans really understand what happened during the occupation and then what happened during the Second World War. Uh, I would tell you that um, as a longtime friend of the Korean American community, I've been going for 20 years to Korea. I used to head the parliamentary exchange before I became uh, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And uh, I think that it was very important that this Congress continue to speak out on the injustice. And so, when the mayor of Osaka made those vile remarks, suggesting that comfort women were volunteers, I immediately took to the House floor to denounce those hateful words, that hateful speech, in the most visible way possible. And when the government of Japan released a report questioning the Kono Statement, I addressed that matter directly, sitting side by side with the Korean ambassador to the United States. Many of you may also know that I made a very personal visit to, to the Glendale Peace Memorial in order to say goodbye to a grandmother who passed away. And I made this visit on the same day that House Resolution 121 was introduced in the House of Representatives. And after my visit to the Peace Memorial, I carried the unified message of all Korean Americans and 
of the opinion of the Congress of the United States to Tokyo and demanded that the government of Japan disavow the hurtful statements made about comfort women in World War II. So I would just make the observation that it is much harder to get tomorrow right if we get yesterday wrong. That's why on issues like Tokyo Island, I've spoken out and explained that that Tokyo Island is Korean, and that it was taken. It was taken during the occupation by Japan, but after the occupation was over, it was time for Japan to recognize the honest history of what happened. We're not going to get the future right if we get the past wrong, and that's why it's important we all speak out, and that's why I will continue to press for full accounting of the atrocities committed during the, uh, the occupation, during the colonization, and then during the Second World War. And uh, here's to our, uh, our family members that were part of that struggle uh, in terms of defeating fascism, whether it was Imperial Japan or in Europe. My father served with General Patton in the Second World War and took photographs at Dachau when they liberated that concentration camp. And, uh, and those photos are in the Museum of Tolerance today. I will share with you that this is a very personal thing to me. And I, I have uh, talked to the families, and I commend all of you for your ongoing efforts. Thank you very much. So now I would like to uh, introduce our Chairman of Board of Directors of WCCW and fourth President, Kristen Choi, for a welcoming remark. Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of WCCW, Washington Coalition for Comfort Women Issues, uh, Chairman of Board, I really uh, welcome you. I am pleased that we are gathered here together to commemorate the 10th House Resolution's uh, 10th anniversary, which passed in 2007. Despite of this milestone accomplishment, the government of Japan has yet to officially acknowledge, accept responsibility, and apologize to the surviving victims. On this meaningful event, I would like to recognize and express our deepest respect and appreciation for Congressman Mike Honda, who as a leader and champion played an instrumental role in the unanimous passage of House Resolution 121. And I would also like to recognize and praise the community leaders scholars, and organizations here in the U.S. and abroad. Through their dedication and tireless grassroots efforts, together we made the passage of this historic U.S. House Resolution a reality. Auspicious occasion commemorating the 10th anniversary of passage of House Resolution 1 to 1 we express our hope and optimism that the government of Japan will finally acknowledge and take full responsibility for the historical truth of the comfort woman. Building on success of House Resolution 1 to 1, we believe that together we can make this reality. God bless. Thank you. Next, uh, I'd like to call our second keynote speaker, the Honorable Mike Honda. He has represented California's 15th district from year 2001 to 2013 
and she has he has also represented the 17th district from 2013 to 2017. He authored and introduced the House Resolution 121 in January of 2007. As the sponsor, he worked relentlessly and succeeded in passing the legislation unanimously. He has been one of the biggest advocators for the cause, continually calling on the Japanese government to formally acknowledge, apologize, and accept historical responsibility. He has stood by the Haimanis and WCCW as a strong ally. If you could come up. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity and uh, this um, wonderful get together commemorating the 10th anniversary. And uh, just wanted to acknowledge WCCW, the leadership, and they're all women. And I want to also uh, recognize uh, CASE, the uh, Korean American for Civic Engagement, uh, the, all the nonprofits and the community organizations across this country that were, were run by the uh, Korean American communities. Very well organized nationally. And I uh, also want to thank um, my chief of staff um, at that time, and um, her name is uh, Jennifer Vanderheide. Uh, they think that uh, they think that uh, Jennifer is my wife, but uh, she's my um, chief of staff, and she's been with me for many, many years. So I, I don't blame people thinking that she's my wife, but she's here. She's the only blonde here, I think. There you are. Stand up. She's a, she's also as tall as us Asians too. And uh, but it was through her um, work and the work with. Um, Another young lady uh, that came in from Peace Corps, born in South Korea, U.S. citizen, and was on our staff. Her name was Helen Chung uh, Bordeaux, who also helped us. And so having staff that reflects the community, having uh, uh, members of the Korean community on staff is a big, big advantage, uh, both in presence and in language. I also want to recognize um, the fact that um, when the Democratic Party took control of Congress, it was then when we were able to have our very first um, public congressional hearing uh, led by uh, Congressman Eni Falomo Vega from America Samoa. And uh, he's just recently passed away, so I just want us to remember his wonderful fight. And before him was uh, Congressman Lane Evans of Illinois who was a veteran of uh, the Vietnam War. And so we had other people uh, who took up the battle when uh, California passed a resolution back in 1999, uh, of which I was the author also. We had also um, exemplary uh, professional staff like Mandy. Uh, would you stand up, Mandy? And uh, please recognize her because uh, with her expertise, and constant uh, work with us, with people like Phyllis Kim, um, Helen Ho, um, and um, Julie, um, Julie Lee. Again, recognize that they're all women. And uh, I think it's appropriate that our women of this country take hold of this issue and move it forward. The, um, the thing that I think we need to recognize in terms of politics is that Unless the party, the dominant party, accepts the idea and supports it, uh, it won't come before the public. And with Ed Royce on the other side, he constantly championed it uh, as uh, chairman of his uh, committee. But it wasn't until uh, we had uh, Nancy Pelosi leading our, leading our uh, congressional members that we were able to do that. And that's why I'm very, um, happy that the chairman of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, uh, Congresswoman uh, Judy Chu, Dr. Judy Chu is here uh, to share some words also, but I want to thank her for being here representing the uh, over 14 congressional members who are Asian Americans, and we have over, well, she'll tell you more about that, I guess. What I want to tell you is that in, in um, 2007, we did pass that resolution. 
But it didn't stop there. Nine other countries did the same thing, only because we were able to do this. And it has not stopped. Other countries have adopted the same resolution or the same sentiment. And we had made an effort that three Hobbinis who went to court in Japan, who dared to speak up and break their silence, their breaking of the silence was a voice heard all around the world. But it was you that was the megaphone that amplified the story, that amplified the situation, that amplified the fact that Prime Minister Abe is unwilling to fulfill the obligations on behalf of his government. And I think that it was mentioned that uh, the Japanese government tried to go to the Supreme Court, trying to bring Glendale <coughs> to the Supreme Court. And if you read the lawsuit, you would have asked yourself, who wrote this? It was so badly written that no court should have even considered it. That's one thing, but the subject matter, that we as U.S. citizens want to do the kinds of things we want to do in this country, we have that right to make sure that we commemorate the kinds of things that happened overseas back in the 30s and the 40s to the end of World War II. Now we, are, we have to also understand that this fight goes beyond just getting an apology. It's another government that's supposed to be our partner that's trying to interfere on this soil in our textbooks in this country that they're trying to interfere with that and that's unacceptable. So the good news of that is you know that you have an impact on Prime Minister Abe's sensitivity and his conscience. So much that he is moving his government to do all these kinds of things at different levels in this country. So be aware and be vigilant and be prepared to push back. In Atlanta, they went full force against the community there. But the community there succeeded in establishing a memorial there. Worldwide, there's over 45 uh, cities around this uh, world who have established this kind of uh, um, memorial. In this country alone, 10 uh, cities have established their memorial and more are to come. So we must lend them support and lend them our experiences so that they can be successful in their own cities. And in Japan, there's got to be at least four or five cities in Japan that came on board and said that we're right and Abe is wrong. So know that your work is producing fruit. Know that even though it's been 10 years, we have to remember that these victims have been suffering over almost 70 years. And so we need to also understand that the urgency that we have over this issue, over this apology that we want Abe to express and share with us, an unambiguous apology and acceptance of historical uh, responsibility that our grandmothers are dying. About a week ago, grandmother uh, Lee, uh, grandmother uh, Kim Jung Ja, had passed away. She was one of the three that came to testify, and we still have our active sister, uh, Lee Lee Young Su, so who was carrying that battle on. But time is short, and we must not allow the leadership of the Japanese government to stall us any longer. The silver lining I see right now is that we have a new leadership in Korea, uh, President Moon, who says he's going to review this past uh, resolution or treaty between Japan and South Korea. That agreement is not worth the paper it's written on because it does not talk to the issue of an apology. And so we must be always ready to be able to speak up, talk back, and bring truth to power. So again, to WCCW and to all the other organizations, I want to thank you for doing this. And I want to thank you for moving this forward. And we have to remember that our resolution was written into law by President Obama and that 
uh, U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Carolyn uh, Kennedy, had spoken to Abe, and also Hillary, as Secretary of uh, State, did mention very clearly and very strongly that comfort woman is a euphemism. What it is is it was sexual slavery, nothing less. So we must continue this fight on behalf of the two to three hundred thousand women who lost their lives, who lost their dignity, to fight for their regaining of their dignity. And as Sister uh, Lee had said, if you cannot apologize to me, then give me back my youth. And in, 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 in that spirit, we must continue this fight together. Thank you so much. I would like to invite Honorable Judy Chu for a con congratulatory remark. She has represented California's 49th district from 2001 to 2006, 4th district from 2007 to 2009, 32nd district from 2009 to 2013, and is currently representing the 27th district since 2013. Congressman Chu is the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. She has been a leader fighting for Ameri Asian American and Pacific Islanders' voice. She has also been a big supporter of the comfort women issues and continuously stresses, stresses the importance of acknowledgement from the Japanese government of their role in the war crime. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to join you, the Washington Coalition for Comfort Women, in marking the 10th anniversary of House Resolution 121. I remember when I first heard about the Comfort Women. I was horrified. I heard the stories of how girls as young as 14 and 15 years old were going to do an errand when they were snatched and then sent off to brothels just to serve Japanese soldiers, these comfort stations. They were forced into servitude, exploited as sex slaves. Their young lives just <coughs> snatched from them. And for years they had to endure this abuse, which was uh, horrible for their livelihood, horrible for their future, horrible for their bodies. But it didn't end there when World War II ended, because then they faced shame for decades. Some were even shunned by their families. So to think that anybody would even suggest that they did this on a voluntary basis is an absolute atrocity. And as a woman myself, I can only uh, feel anguish thinking about that any other woman could face such a situation. So imagine my admiration when I learned about House Resolution 121. I was not here at the time, but I know that an incredible man, Congress member Mike Honda, took up the lead. Took up the lead for this very important resolution to recognize the history of the comfort women. And let me tell you, he did it at great sacrifice to himself. I mean, Congress member Honda is Japanese American. He took on the government of Japan. There were even Japanese Americans that did not support him in this effort. And yet he continued on. Why? Because he knew it was the right thing to do. So it took a great deal of passion and courage for him to do it. Let us give a huge round of applause to this amazing leader this amazing leader who brought about House Resolution 121.
But today, we have more work to do. It's so critical for us to continue this conversation and keep up the pressure on Japan. Because for over seven decades, they refused to acknowledge the pain that comfort women suffered. And time is running out. We're all saddened by the passing of Kim Jong Kim, Kim Jong Ganja, who came to testify here in the Capitol about her terrifying experiences. And so, for the last remaining 37 Korean survivors, we must make sure that they are able to find peace. And that's why I've joined other members of Congress to call upon Japanese leaders to formally acknowledge Japan's role in forcing thousands of women into sex slavery during World War II and to truly apologize. In fact, prior to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's joint address to Congress in 2015, I repeatedly called on Japan to acknowledge and apologize for this wrongdoing. It is clear that there is only one acceptable path forward, and that is to directly address this historical wrong by taking steps to ensure that this history is not only recognized, but because of that, that it never happens again. And we must make sure that Japan makes a commitment to educating future generations about these crimes. These crimes cannot be attributed to the cost of war because under any circumstance, it was not right. And that history has to be told, truthfully, in textbooks and classrooms. That's why I'm so honored to join you today. Now let me thank you, the Washington Coalition, because for two decades, you've ensured that there continues to be international pressure to right this wrong. I can tell just by looking around this room that you're a group of very strong women and that you are not going to give up. And so, together, let us keep pushing to bring justice for the survivors and all the women who suffered. Let's keep fighting until they get the apology they deserve. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Honorable Judy Chu. Um, Honorable Eliana Ross Litton has joined us. Thank you for coming. Thank um, you. She has represented Florida's 110th district from 1982 to 1986, the 34th district from 1986 to 1989, and she is currently representing um, the 27th district from 1989. If you'd like thank to come up so and share much. some words. Yes, thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you, Judy, and thank you, Mike, and thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you to the uh, Washington Coalition for Comfort Women Issues. Uh, what a wonderful publication you have put out. Uh, very insightful. Thank you for inviting me here today to just give a few brief words in commemoration of the 10th anniversary of the passage of House Resolution 121. And the full text of it is right here in, in your, uh, on your tables. Uh, and I'm proud to have been a, a sponsor of this important resolution. It is a truly remarkable and important milestone for the comfort women issue. And, and as, as, uh, as the group has pointed out, the Washington Coalition for Comfort Women Issues, when I use the word comfort women, I realize that what you say here is true. That it is, the term comfort women is, is controversial. We understand that, and as, and as you point out, it's a controversial term that has been denied by the victims criticizing it as a crude objectification of the women's purpose as a tool forced upon them rather than a statement of their will as human beings. But because it has been so associated with our legislation, hello old friend, um, the victims are referred to as comfort women in a majority of the documents and sources. So for research purposes, it is still being used. And I realize that military sex slave and forced sex slaves, uh, women drafted for military slavery by Japan are the correct term. So you will excuse me when I use 
comfort women because it has been the source of, of legislation that we have passed. But I was so proud to have been a sponsor of that resolution. But many thanks, as Judy pointed out, to our great, our great colleague, Mike Honda. Mike, we miss you every day. You got to take another bow. You got to take another applause. And also, I want to point out someone who's not no longer with us, uh, the late uh, uh, member, Eni Falomo Vega. He was a wonderful uh, communicator of this issue to all of our colleagues. But thank you to communities like the ones who are represented here today. Uh, this resolution has raised a tremendous amount of awareness on this issue. Uh, this comfort women issue here in Congress and indeed around the world. So we've got to keep talking about it. Japan's use of comfort women during World War II represents one of history's most horrific examples of human rights abuses and we should never, never stop educating. We should never stop raising awareness about human trafficking and the pain that these women suffered. It is not in the history books, it is alive here and now. And because at its essence, the comfort women issue is about human rights. It's about the rights of women all over the world to live with dignity, to live with honor. It's still very, very real today. It is not an issue that has gone away. Just this morning in our House Foreign Affairs Committee, you've been a part of that for many, many a decade. How long did you work on that committee? 13 years. 13 years. And, uh, and I'm still there, and I've been there going on 29 years. Uh, but it passed my bill, which is the North Korea Human Rights Act, and it includes a provision to provide humanitarian assistance to the women of North Korea who are victims of trafficking. So the pain endures. This problem continues. It's the modern day equivalent of what went on during World War II and it is appalling practice. It is a shameful practice and it needs all of our direct attention. It needs all of our immediate attention. And that is why along with Mike and Judy, we continue to urge Japan to condemn all human trafficking, both past and present, and work together so that we can put an end to the comfort women issue once and for all. And what you are calling for uh, in your pamphlet and what House Resolution 121 called for when we passed it is still very much needed. Formally acknowledge, apologize, and accept historical responsibility in a clear and unequivocal manner for its imperial armed forces coercion of young women into sexual slavery. It uh, clarify and publicly refute any claims that any sexual enslavement and trafficking of comfort women by the Japanese imperial forces never occurred. And, of course, what we want is a true acknowledgement and a true apology. And we continue to wait for that issue to be resolved. Thank you so very much. It is an honor to have been with you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy and Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for letting me be a part. Thank you. You're very nice. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful words. Among those that have contributed to the passing of House Resolution 121, we must not forget to recognize late Congressman Lane Evans, who originated the Comfort Women Resolution. Um, during those times, Congressman Evans worked heavily with Dr. Okja Seo, who was serving as the second president of WCCW. She spearheaded the campaign to pass the legislation and also testified at the U.S. House hearing of February 2007. Dr. Sa, if you could come up. Today I'm honored to remember the late Congressman Lane Evans. He was born in Rock Island, Illinois on August 4, 1951 and went to the Lord on November 5, 2014. He served his office as a humble 
and faithful public servant for 24 years. In November 1999, he raised the first torch on comfort woman issues, paving the road for those victims to speak of, the, of their ordeal on Capitol Hill. As he demonstrated in his life, he strongly believed the principle of, quote, we have a duty to help those who need our help. We have a duty to stand up for those who cannot stand up on their own. We have a duty to speak for those who have no voices and to do what is just and what is right, unquote. He was the voice for the voiceless, truly a hero of victims of human rights, unquote. During his time in office, he introduced House resolutions on comfort woman issues for five times until he retired from his illness in, in January 2007. On his sick bed, he rejoiced in the passage of House Resolution 1 to 1 in 2007. Thank you. And here is the summary of the House Resolution 1. Uh, House Resolution 1 to 1 is a resolution by the House of Representatives expressing the sent, uh, sentiment that the Japanese government should formally acknowledge, apologize, and accept historical responsibility for causing young women into sexual slavery known to the word comfort women. There's a four demands of the House Resolution 1 to 1 are that the government of Japan, number one, should formally acknowledge, apologize, and accept historical responsibility in a clear and unequivocal manner for its imperial armed forces coercion of young women into sexual slavery, known to the world as comfort women, during its colonial and wartime occupation of Asia and the Pacific Island from the 1930s through the duration of the World War II. Number two, the government of Japan would help to resolve recurring questions about the sincerity and status of prior statements of the Prime Minister of Japan if the Prime Minister of Japan were to make such an apology as a public statement in his official capacity. Number three, the government of Japan should clearly and publicly refute any claims that the sexual enslavement and trafficking of the comfort women for the Japanese Imperial Armed Forces never occurred. And finally, the government of Japan should educate current and future generations about the horrible crime while following the recommendations of the international community with, his, uh, with respect to the comfort woman. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Julie Jiangshu Li, the current president of WCCW, would like to present recognition awards to all those who have contributed directly to the House Resolution 121. Before he leaves, uh, we'd like to uh, recognize Congressman Ed Royce for his uh, contribution to the House Resolution 121. In special recognition of the Honorable Ed Royce, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives and Chairman of Foreign Affairs Committee, for your con a commitment to the advancement of women's rights through contribution to the Comfort Women Resolution of the U.S. House of Representatives of 2007 on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of House Resolution 121 ceremony, the Washington Coalition for Comfort Women Issues, July 27, 2007. Thank you. Thank you. Thank in special recognition of the Honorable Mike Honda, we come up, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from 2001 to 2007, for your commitment to the advancement of women's rights through contribution to the Comfort Women Resolution 
of the U.S. House of Representatives of 2007 on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of House Resolution 121 ceremony. The Washington Coalition for Comfort Women Issues, July 27, 2007. And I will pause, please. Why don't you give him a big round of applause? Uh, next is in special recognition of Ms. Tomu Lee Ham. She is the founding president of WCCW from 1992 to 2001. Next, in special recognition of Dr. Okja Sa. She was the president of WCCW from 2001 to 2008. In special recognition of Mr. Dennis Halpin, he is a visiting scholar at the U.S. Korea Institute at SAIS Johns Hopkins. In special recognition of Ms. Mindy Kotler, she's the director of Asia Policy Point. <laughs> Next, in special recognition of Ms. Annabelle Park, the National Coordinator for the 121 Coalition in 2007. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't forget your guest. Um, next is in special recognition of Mr. Moon Hyung Ri. Representative of National Coalition for House Resolution 121 in 2007. <laughs> and that, last but not least, in special recognition of Ms. Phyllis Kim, Executive Director of Korean American Forum of California. You're present. Uh, next, President Lee would like to present a certificate of appreciation as an encouragement for the future of those contributing to the spirit of the resolution through active campaigns. In special recognition of Miss Helen Wong, Asia Pacific World War II Memorial Incorporated. For your commitment to the advancement of women's rights through contribution to the Comfort Women Resolution of the U.S. House of Representatives of 2007 on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of House Resolution 121 ceremony. <laughs> Next is in special recognition of Ms. Sulia Chan. Global Alliance for Preserving the Truth of World War II. Same as above. Okay. 
in special recognition of Ms. Monica Jun, or organizer of Comfort Women Day oh, in Glendale. She could not attend, so we will deliver that to her later. Um, and not, last but not least, um, in special recognition of Ms. Shin Min Park uh, for your commitment to the advancement of women's rights through contribution to spirit and meaning of Comfort Women Resolution of the U.S. House of Representatives of 2007 on the occasion of the 10th ceremony of House Resolution 121 ceremony. And if everyone who has received an award, please come up for a group photo. Thank you very much for the honor, and it is an honor. Um, I just wanted to say I actually am an independent scholar, runs a small think tank that studies uh, Asian history and Japanese history and Japanese war crimes. And I was very honored when Mr. Honda asked me to help with the resolution. And so there's a few things I'd like you to know about and understand and when Mr. Honda said that we need to keep fighting it's true because the Japanese government and the Japanese right wing which supports this current government has unleashed a barrage of vitriol and fake history and fake news and have been paying a number of white faces to distribute bad news. But one of the things going back to the resolution when you say that you want um, a unambiguous apology. What you really want is an unequivocal apology. What you need to know, and, and God is in the details, is that the Japanese government, the executive of the Japanese government, is the cabinet and not the prime minister. So if the cabinet does not approve legislation or a statement or a speech or a policy, it is not really policy. So there has been no apology, and there have been many, many apologies, the Japanese will point out, to the comfort women for the war. For the war, there's only been four cabinet-approved apologies. For the comfort women, none. The co in fact, there was a cabinet decision, this is what they call cabinet-approved, for a statement saying that the Kono statement, which is the first apology to the comfort women was not a cabinet decision. In other words, saying it is unofficial, uh, not legal, and not right. And um, so that was a very destructive uh, a cabinet decision. And then when Mr. Abe, Prime Minister Abe, spoke in Congress, when he spoke at Hiroshima, when he spoke at Pearl Harbor, and his unknown <coughs> apology statement to Park Young-hae, none of these, and I mean none of these, were cabinet approved. So in other words, they were his opinion, they were unofficial, they were unlegal. And so what you need to work for is for the Japanese cabinet to approve a statement of apology. And that has not happened. And what will it take will take probably a new government. Because there has just been incredible lobbying, formal and informal, for, from the government, from organizations, to Japanese companies who, to, who know that if anyone supports the comfort women, they will threaten to withdraw money, they will threaten to withdraw support, and they will actually go ahead and do that. Um, that's very important for you to know, and you need to be always vigilant on how the Japanese have been combating. Like, I had put together a team of 17 scholars from around the world, experts on history, linguistics, uh, politics on Japan to help Mr. Honda. Many of them are under, get death threats now. Whenever you get something published, I get a, you get a barrage of hate mail. Death and, and, and horrible things. There's one professor who has to have the FBI monitor her email of what the Japanese right wing is doing. But you need to be forever vigilant and always asking questions. And they are using a lot of fake analysis and fake history 
to overturn the ideas and to convince people who are not um, knowledgeable about Asia. So keep fighting. Uh, and remember, it is for all the women, girls, and there were boys who were made into comfort women. For the Australian nurses, for the Dutch mothers, for the Tamil workers on the Burma Road, who the, the, the Filipino girls, it was a horrific system. Keep fighting. Thank you, Mindy, for sharing your words. Now I would like to introduce you to a film titled Apology. It is a 2016 documentary film by Tiffany Shum. Um, it follows the personal journeys of three former comfort women, Grandma Gil from South Korea, Grandma Kao from China, and Grandma Adela from the Philippines. They were among the 200,000 girls and young women kidnapped and forced into military sexual slavery by the Imperial Japanese Army during World War II. Uh, facing their past after 70 some years, they know that time is running out to give a first-hand account of the truth and ensure that this horrific chapter of history is not forgotten. Shun has worked on the project for nearly a decade and faces ongoing resistance of the film. Uh, WCCW is planning on a screening of the film in the late summer, early fall. Please enjoy a short clip trailer of the film. If I can tell my, my children all about it, I would be very happy. If they love me. But anyways, when I know what happened to me. いや、僕は違うんだ。え、違うんだ。At this time, I'd like to ask everyone for a moment of silence for Haimoni Kim Gunja, who recently passed away on July 23rd. Su Harmony has sent a congratulatory video for us. Um, she is a very proactive and has been with us on several occasions, including the time of Prime Minister Abe's speech at the Congress in 2015.
여기도 오신터네 그 말고 온다 전하고 결혼하는 통과 10주년에 아이고 못 가서 너무 죄송하고요 말고 혼나 이혼이 오해 안 했으면 좋겠어요 이혼이 이혼일 때는 갖고 이혼 떨어지고 나서는 안 간다고 오해하지 마시고 너무 저도 바쁘, 바빴어요 할머니도 돌아가시고 이래가지고 장례식에도 참석해야 되고 해서 뭐, 못 가게 됐습니다. 꼭 가야 되는데, 다음에는 꼭 가겠습니다. 여러분들이 또, 우리, 이렇게, 교포 여러분들 참 열심히 해주셨는데, 그 보답도 제가 해야 되는데 제가 못했습니다. 이 점은 널리 이해해 주시고, 다음에는 꼭 가서 배웠겠습니다. 여러분, 감사합니다. 사랑합니다. 아이 to summarize shortly, she apologizes for not being able to come. She is preoccupied um, with funerals and such other busy schedules. Um, she can't thank everyone enough for all the hard work, and she promises to join us next time. All over the world, there are many organizations working for comfort women awareness. We cannot mention all of them, but President Lee will talk about the history of comfort women movements in the United States. 안녕하세요. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, we're going to start our lunch actually at uh, 12.45, so it seems like less than 10 minutes left <laughs> before end. So let me brief, let me really concise and short, okay? Um, the first of all, um, if you feel like you left out of the recognition, please, you know, don't feel sorry because, you know, there are so many organizations and individuals involved in here. So there's another recognition at the end of the year, at the end of the year, uh, which is the 25th anniversary of WCCW. So, you know, it's coming soon. So let me briefly, like in 10 minutes of 10th anniversary, during this 10th anniversary, what old is this that we're supposed to show? Okay, Come From Women Movement in the U.S. This is a huge title, huge title. The movement is some group of people working together to advance with the shared value and ideas. So I just dare to say this is Come From Women Movement, since we have, uh, uh, Phyllis know that it's kind of a growing like a snowball. You know, how many in the email list, you know that? Did you count? I think it's 100. Almost 3,000 3, 3, uh, involved in to make a joint statement in whole, all of the world. So it's a really movement. So maybe let me skip this part. I just wanted to show you, just make sure the definition of a comfort woman, maybe everybody in this room, a lady know the definition. Um, the one thing for sure, it's a girl. I mean, the oldest, the youngest one was 13 years old, which is actually 12 years old in Korean age. And then there is some record, there is a boy who are trafficked too. And then the comfort woman stations, you, you know that there is a purpose of that is not just prevent the sex crime rape in outside of uh, military barrack, but also, you know, to keep the, their secret documentary, you know, without letting out outside of their territory. And then why do we still use this comfort woman? Is as the, I think is, Juritsu, whoever, the, the congresswoman pointed out it's because of, uh, you know, documents, all the documents and all the archives still have this come from women, the terminology, so that we have to, you know, compile and archives. That's why we're still using this term, even though, you know, a lot of, uh, for example, the former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, clearly um, redefined the terminology as military sexual slave, military sexual slave, but uh, or even the victims wanted to be called as a harmony, which is a grandma in Korean. But uh, we still use using the comfort of women because of the archiving purpose. You know, the first comfort woman who came forward and saying that that I was a, a traffic and used was Hak Sun Kim, which is 1991. But just a year after, which is 1992, here in the Washington D.C. 
Korean United Methodist Church, the Gum Ju Hwang, who you know testify, and then our founding president Dong Woo Lee just uh, quit her job in World Bank and then founded this WCCW. So we have a 25th anniversary at the end of this year, and then at the same time the Yan Ruff. Actually, I forgot to. I forgot to push my the timing, so yeah, timing, please let me know the when is on, time's up. Okay, let me finish by then. And if you see the, our website, comfort-woman.org, this is all our mission. As I said, it's not just being a voice of comfort women, but at the same time to eradicate and then uh, prevent any kind of sex crime against women, um, and then through research and education. And we honor the House of Sharing in Seoul and then the Cheongdae Help and then their seven demands. This is the introduction so far, <laughs> sorry. And then the dimensions and directions of Comfort Women Movement in the U.S. Uh, among many dimensions and directions, I just, you know, scratched the surface, only the five things right now, which is a women's right, grassroots movements and educations and publications and Comfort Women memorials and production of artwork and archive <coughs> project. This is all going on United States. I just narrowed down within the United States since we're living over here. But as I said, it's, all, it's happening in all of the world. So women's right grassroots movement that led to the legislations, and it starts lots of demonstration, hearing, and publications. And uh, Tong Wu Lee, our founding president, remembered the her that there's lots of demonstration, but this one is, uh, as far as I know, the one of the largest one in front of a White House. And then the, the very recent one is a rally in front of a Capitol Hill when the Prime Minister Abe visited here 2015. And she did a lot of, uh, you know, photographic exhibition derived from the archives. And then she invited seven, eight comfort women to testify. Nine, yeah, nine. And the back row from Second from the left is uh, she, you know, she was really young, 17 years ago. And then there is a hearing. Uh, Michael Honda introduced this hearing and Ed Royce helped it. And then these three um, harmonies, actually, the Gunza Kim, the first one is just past like a 23rd, last Sunday. And then Yongsu, the harmony that you just saw, and then the Dutch comfort woman too, they were there, three of them. And then giving support, growing support from legislature around the world, uh, not just House Resolution one to one, but it's an everywhere in um, national level, state level, and the recent one that we involved was uh, the Maryland House Resolution SJR three. The second, educational resources. This is the first book ever published by WCCW on the left one, Comfort Women Speak. And it includes the testimonies and United, United States and uh, United Nations human rights reports. And then the legacy of comfort women of World War II was a seminal scholarly book that really you know, extensively uh, researched and study about the comfort women issues and co-authored by our um, board of directors, Banio, and then Professor Margaret Stetz from Delaware University. Can you raise your hand, Margaret Stetz? And then after this book, a lot of a book, you know, have been published. A lot of a book have been published. And the one of the book is a recent one is Chinese Comfort Woman is is a very very important book. And the author of Pei Pei Chui, Pei, what is the right pronunciation? Chui. Yeah, Pei Pei Chui. Could you raise your hand? <laughs> she wrote in this book. There is another two hundred thousand Comfort Women were trafficked only in China. The reason they couldn't come forward because the China treat this woman as a you know a conceit with the, with the enemies. And then these documents, she said in this book, was uh, submitted by Japanese scholars, which means almost four hundred thousands and four hundred thousands, which is a great one. Daughters of Dragon is a novel. It's not a scholarly book, but based on a lot of research. Interesting thing is, a lot of schools start to teach about comfort women. Um, we participated in the uh, Berkshire Conference in New York, and one of the largest feminist conferences there. We found out that so many people, whether, whether it's a women's study, history, politics, 
or uh, Asian studies they teach in, in part or as a whole. This is a, one of the examples of a syllabus that is a 12 pages. If you wanted to get it, just let me know. I can share this 12 pages of syllabus and it just compiled all the materials about the comfort of women. Publications in media. The media attention is endless media attention. Uh, one of the left one is The Hill, Lane Evans, and the right one is an our recent one in Washington Post, whole page. And then collaboration with um, the Phyllis a case, and then um, Chinese Global, what is the name? Yeah, well, he or she. Yeah, she contributed a lot. So uh, this is a, like a, not by one organization or one personnel. It's more likely collaborative work. Third, memorial. Memorial is per se is to remember, not to forget, and then commemorate the person or the event. So we commemorate the comfort of women and to record and educate the historical truths and to use the reminder of human rights, women's rights, and universal justice and pieces. But not just for the comfort women issues. A lot of uh, audiences came and visit there and then they kind of uh, um, sort of uh, appropriate the issues and apply to their life. That is called intersubjectivity. Because one of my PhD dissertation is about um, the public monuments and how the people appreciate the public monuments. Uh, and a lot of them, the first one, I'm going to even say the enumerate the, the first, the second, and third, and fourth is Glendale, and fifth is done by, built by WCCW, and six and sevens. And then eighth was actually the Orange County, but they, they, while they were hesitating and then deal with the, some of the controversy, uh, there is a, a eighth one. Okay, eighth one is a, just recently, June 30, as you know, the Brookhaven has a girl's statue. So that's the eighth as a memorial, but the third as a girl's statue. And then the ninth one is a San Francisco. It's coming soon in, in the beginning of September. What is the date, Phyllis? Uh, we don't have the date yet. Okay, so sometime in September. Sometime in September. Is, no, no, within this year. Oh, within this year. Okay, so, <laughs> and then, um, so that's it. There's a memorial and then the monuments and things going on. The production of artworks, this is my favorite favorite one, is set by the Holocaust artist whose name is Boltanski. Art making is not about telling the truth, but making the truth felt. We organized collateral damage the last year in collaboration with uh, um, John Jay College of Criminal Justice and then symposium and exhibition and performances, a lot of things going on. And so many students came over and then I was amazed by their passion. And then I realized that they got some writing assignment from the professors of college. But whether, whatever that it takes, it's a great. And Hyung Nyu is the one that I just brought it is, she's, um, Okay, I don't have time. <laughs> so she's a major uh, artist actually. Her work is a study to get into the art history textbook and it's a great artist. But her work is, because I organized a first Korean government led exhibition in here, is traveling right now. So I couldn't invite her work, which is amazing. She derived it from the photos that we could find the NARA, National Archive of, um, what is that abbreviation? National Archive Research Administrations. And she got these photos and then interpreted in her own subjective way. All these wonderful artists, especially one of my favorites, Tomiyama Taeko, on the left, on the right one, is there is some eyes crying. The man starts to work, the woman is watching and cry. That's what the poem she wrote. Finally, archiving. Um, you know, without any questions, everybody agree with me the needs of archive because to, um, to have a certain kind of unarguable primary sources, <coughs> you know, unarguable primary sources. <coughs> and so we just uh, launching webinar project, WCSW last year, which was actually the pioneer, sort of a pilot program, so which was not perfectly successful, but anyway, we studied. And then this year, we're going to collaborate with the Johns Hopkins University and Ewa Women's University. More university will be involved. And then webinar projects is one good thing is we don't really need the space. We don't really much money, but it can involve the whole world to archive a project. 
So not just the research associate, but for the publics, they can use all this material that we're going to compile. OK, this is the last slide. You might be very familiar with these images. If you're Googling, maybe this image is the first two things that you can come up with. And very recently, actually, a couple of weeks ago, the Seoul National University in Seoul, they found the video clip of these images. So I'm going to finish with this video clip. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Lee. That was um, the video found by the Seoul University. Um, we have near the end of the program. Um, we will wrap up with the ceremony with closing marks from Ms. Tongwu Lee Ham. She is the founding president of WCCW. She founded the organization 25 years ago in 1992. Thank you very much. Thank you. When Dr. Lee asked me just for two minutes uh, closing marks, and so I got the message that, okay, this is to uh, seek God's blessings to WCCW and the supporting groups of people and all the leading heroes and everybody here to fight against this issue again. And so today, I want to just ask, uh, we have uh, given big hands to leading hero of passage of HR 121, <laughs> and uh, also recognized Lane Evans. And let me add this chance not to waste my deep appreciation of, uh, uh, to the uh, late representative William Lipinski, who did first initiated the passage 105 in 1993. And uh, I want to close my closing remarks with to request for just let's have a couple minutes to recognize and to, uh, give them our you know, memorial just hearts to William Lipinski and uh, Harmony Kim Gunja, who just passed away a few days ago. And God bless you, God bless WCCW, God bless us. And let's have a couple minutes of memorials. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was my honor and privilege. And I will see you again in December. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Ms. Ham. Um, just a couple ending announcements. If you have not picked up uh, a brochure for this event, or if you'd like to see any brochures for past events, they're available in the front by the reception desk. And also, please check our website, uh, www.comfort-women.org, for updates on the screening of the film Apology. Um, before everyone goes and enjoys the reception, um, please gather up front for a group photo. Thank you again for joining us on this noteworthy day.